Alan Rockefeller is a mycologist and mushroom photographer based in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. He's been studying mushrooms for the last 20 years, and he has now photographed more than 2,500 species of fungi and has uploaded 700 DNA sequences of fungi that he has found to uh, GenBank. He regularly identifies mushrooms for several uh, fungus fairs in uh, Mexico and the U.S., uh, and has identified over 250,000 mushrooms on websites, including uh, iNaturalist and Mushroom Observer and Facebook groups. Uh, Alan has uh, pioneered the use of DNA in local North American mushroom clubs. Uh, at one time, uh, DNA analysis uh, to, to uh, identify mushrooms was pretty much confined to uh, academic circles. Uh, it's now spreading and through the clubs and Alan has been one of the vehicles uh, of that spread. Um, so he's in high demand uh, as an expert at mushroom fairs where he teaches uh, workshops on DNA barcoding and mushroom photographer, photography and fungal microscopy. And uh, he has published new species of bioluminescent fungi in Mycena and Psilocybe. On a personal note, Alan has helped Andy. Alan helped Andy and me when we were putting together the mushrooms of BC. He generously allowed us to use six of his mushroom photos in the book. So many of you have already seen his work. Uh, so welcome, Alan, to Canada. And we hope you can carry yourself away from the election returns long enough to, to tell us about your work in bioluminescent fungi. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so I'm over here in Seattle right now, and I have been traveling for three months uh, looking for mushrooms every day. I've been to a whole lot of places uh, from Mexico to Arizona, Pennsylvania, um, Illinois, Alabama, and you know, all over the place. And now I'm in the West Coast, kind of slowly heading, uh, heading south, and finally I'll get home um, in about a week. So I talk about luminescent or talk about glowing mushrooms today. And so there are two kinds of glowing mushrooms. You have luminescent mushrooms or bioluminescent mushrooms. And so those glow in the dark, they create their own light. And then you have fluorescent mushrooms and fluorescent mushrooms convert ultraviolet light into visible light. So with luminescent mushrooms, you always have the same color. They're right about 530 nanometers, which is green. And then with fluorescent mushrooms, you have all sorts of different colors. You also have phosphorescent, and that's when you have a glow-in-the-dark t-shirt, or there's some rocks and minerals that are phosphorescent, uh, but there's no phosphorescent organisms in nature. So we'll look at some bioluminescent mushrooms first. This is Armillaria mycelium, and this one I found at Salt Point State Park in California. And when I photograph um, any, any glowing mushroom, I always take the same exact picture in white light or in complete darkness. And that way I can flip back and forth between the pictures and you can see which parts are glowing and fluorescent. So in this one, you can see these black zones of inhibition here. So that armillaria is right in the middle. And then the rest of it is just wood colonized by other fungi. Now this particular one, I sequenced it and it turned out that it matched Armillaria sinipina, which is a pretty common uh, bioluminescent uh, Armillaria on the West Coast. And then this one I found in Ecuador. And um, as far as I can tell, it's probably a new species, uh, maybe in Geronema. And so in this one, the whole mushroom glows, the stem a little bit brighter. And I find these things by turning off all lights and walking very slowly through the forest after letting my eyes adjust for about five minutes. And so sometimes, um, sometimes people use like these red headlamps to you know, walk around the woods at the night. I find it's actually better to use a white light, but an extremely dim white light. So like the, the white light, from a, a cell phone, if it's kind of like your screen is real dim, that way um, it doesn't uh, doesn't blow out any of uh, of the cones in your eye. 
So they're better than like red lights and you can see in regular color. And as long as your light is extremely dim, then it won't uh, destroy your night vision at all. So then I set up the camera and, uh, and take the pictures uh, on a tripod. Um, this is one that is almost endemic to California. This is Umphalotus olivacens. And so this one, someone just gave it to me. So I took it to the lab, set it on the ground, and did the long exposure here. There's a bunch of Umphalotus species. Uh, not all of them glow, but this one glows pretty well. Another one that glows in the dark that you probably have in British Columbia is Canella stypticus. And so here are some that are cultivated, and these are grown on sawdust. And you can order this culture online. Um, and then this is also Pinellas stepkiss, and this I found in the wild in Michigan. And a lot of people say that the Pinellas stepkiss on the West Coast is not bioluminescent. However, I found some in California that is glowing in the dark, so I think that that's not true, and it's just some collections below and others don't. Uh, but these here are some that I found in Michigan. And you can see that there's pretty good depth of field on these. And so I use focus stacking. And focus stacking is really helpful with bioluminescent photos because it allows you to keep the aperture all the way open, but still get really good depth of field. So I focus stacked uh, about 30 pictures for this. Um, and there were about, there were 30 second exposures each. And so that took about 15 minutes to, to take the exposure. Usually it's, it's a little bit faster, depending on how bright the mushroom is. Um, like this one here, this is a one second exposure. And this is a photo that Matt Schink took of me, um, the same one we saw on the previous slide, Canella stypticus. And this, um, I just had to stand really still. And uh, he just was able to take a picture of me holding this log. Another one that you have um, in British Columbia is Mycena roridus. And Mycena roridus is one of these really slimy Mycena, uh, Mycenas, and sometimes uh, people will call it uh, Roridomyces. Uh, this one happens to be growing on a can oak acorn. And um, this photo I took in the middle of the day. Uh, but to get it dark enough, I went into the bathroom at Soma Camp and closed the door. And there was just a little bit of light coming in through the door. So you can see the bioluminescence uh, of the mycelium in the acorn, uh, but it's also lit up from the light coming in the door. Now this mushroom is not, uh, not luminescent at all. It's only the mycelium. So that's why you see the mushrooms not glowing at all. It's just some certain spots on the acorn. Here's one that I found in Florida. I don't think this one has a name yet, but it's a mycena. And this one does not glow at all, but the mycelium is very luminescent. So that's pretty common. There's a lot of mycenas like that. Here is a muscadine grape leaf, which has this mycena mycelium on it. So that looks pretty cool because it's really rhizomorphic. Um, here's one that I found in Oaxaca, Mexico. And I found this one at three in the morning. And this uh, did not have a name when I found it, but it's now mycena lumina. And so Mycena lumina is pretty bright and it grows on oak. Um, really cool thing. I've seen it in Oaxaca and Veracruz and Hidalgo. Uh, I find that Southeastern Mexico is one of the best places to find uh, luminescent mushrooms. I've seen about 25 species that glow in the dark there, which is more than is known from anywhere else in the world. Uh, this one, um, is another one that I helped publish. This one is Mycena lux follicula. And this one, um, the stem glows much brighter than the rest of it. So you see the cap glows a little bit and the mycelium glows a little bit, but the stem is really bright. So when you're walking through the woods at night, you'll see these little vertical lines. And those are the stems of these mushrooms. This is one of my favorite ones. This one is Mycena globulispera. And Mycena globulispera was described from Brazil. Um, it was described just about 10 years ago and the people who discovered it didn't realize that it glows in the dark. It's actually extremely dim. Uh, but the really cool thing about it is that the gill edges glow more than the rest of it. 
So this here is a 40 minute exposure because uh, it was so dim. I just opened the shutter and went to sleep. And after about 40 minutes, my camera ran out of batteries. And in the morning I checked the camera and had this picture. And then uh, here's one that is Mycena fulgoris, also from Veracruz, Mexico. And the stem glows very brightly on this one too, and the rest of the mushroom very little. Um, here's the first bioluminescent mushroom that I saw. This one is Mycena nebula. And when I found it for the first time, it was 2012, and it didn't have a name yet, but um, this one only grows on the bark of liquid amber trees. And so sometimes when you're walking through the forest um, at night, and this is only in the cloud forest of Veracruz, you'll see liquid amber trees and they're covered in these mushrooms. Sometimes there's hundreds of these mushrooms on the same tree. So it's Mycenae nebula, um, like the nebula of stars. This one is Mycenae lux, uh, let's see, it's lux. No so I just, uh, just saw it the other day. Uh, Lux arboricola. And so Mycena Lux arboricola was described from uh, Brazil. And when they uh, discovered it, they only found just a couple very tiny mushrooms. So this collection from Veracruz uh, is a much better collection. Uh, it has matching DNA sequence to what's in Brazil. And so this one has a stem base that glows very brightly. And then these ones also glow in the parts of the cap that get bit by insects. Here's one that is Mycena stylobates. Um, this is growing on a beech leaf. And so these mushrooms don't glow, but the mycelium glows pretty well. So here is a beech leaf from Veracruz, Mexico. And if you look at the parts of the uh, leaf that are lighter in color, they're being bleached out by this Mycena mycelium. And those are also the parts that are glowing. Uh, this one doesn't have a name yet, but when it does get named, it's going to be Mycena lux minor, and it's very tiny. So this is a liquid amber or a sweet gum seed pod here, and the largest cap is only about three millimeters across. So this mushroom doesn't glow, but the mycelium glows pretty well, and then the primordia glows. So you see a lot of glowing liquid amber seed pods. And then this is the brightest one that I've ever seen. Um, this one is named after, um, after my friend's girl, uh, ex-girlfriend, Perla, and is Mycena Perla. And so when we discovered this um, in the state of Hidalgo in 2013, um, maybe 2014, uh, we were camping out uh, around the fire, and uh, I told him I was going to go look for glowing mushrooms, and he just kind of laughed at me. And so I wandered off into the woods and it was super dark and really rainy. And then I stepped in a big puddle and got all wet, but I kept walking. And after about a hundred yards, I saw a whole bunch of very brightly glowing caps. And so uh, we were very surprised to see them there. Um, that was the cloud forest of Hidalgo. Um, so these are some of the pictures that I took um, the first night that I found it. Um, and so my friend um, got the collections and he named them after his girlfriend, Perla. Uh, but unfortunately, they broke up before it got published. So it's usually a good idea to name mushrooms after a unique feature that they have rather than after a person. Because uh, in 10,000 years, the name of a person won't have a lot of meaning, uh, but a unique feature uh, will still have meaning. Uh, fortunately, the cap looks a lot like a pearl, so it still works. Um, this is the brightest one. The mycelium does not glow at all, um, and the stem doesn't glow, but the cap is extremely bright. For example, this uh, shot here is only a six second exposure, and it's so bright that if you pick up a cap and you throw it at night, it looks like a shooting star, it makes a streak across your vision. And I see them in Veracruz, and I also see them in uh, Hidalgo. And they usually grow in conifer litter, uh, sometimes they grow on, uh, on pine needles like this one here. And sometimes I'll take a photo where I use, use a little bit of light from uh, LED light and then uh, kind of uh, move it in an arc over the lens to get you know, even lighting. Uh, but then also do a long exposure so you can see the mushroom, but you can also see the glowing. So that's why some parts are green here and other parts not. 
this one has not been named yet, but when it does get named, it'll be Mycena lux pelliculosa. And that's because this Mycena has a separable, separable gelatinous pellicle. So if you try to peel the cap, uh, this little film peels right off. And it only grows uh, on members of the coffee family, the Rubiaceae in Oaxaca. This one is really interesting. Um, I found it several feet off the ground in Jalisco. So that's in, uh, on the west coast of Mexico, a very special place called Bosque de Maple. And so the mu mushroom doesn't glow at all, but it makes this twig glow pretty brightly. And it has these mycenas that kind of have an offset center in the stem. So they're probably in resin of mycena. This is the most interesting find uh, that was from Bosque de Maple in Jalisco. Uh, this one, I still don't know what it is, but it's this mycelium that's coming off these twigs and it's glowing. So it's like these glowing bottle brushes. Um, so somewhere I have the collection, I need to sequence it and figure out what it is, probably a mycena of some sort, um, which is a really cool looking thing. Um, and that one I found several feet off the ground. It was like 12 or 15 feet off the ground, kind of up in the trees, these glowing sticks. And I had to kind of reach up with a stick and knock it down. So uh, I'll talk for a second about taking pictures of mushrooms uh, in the dark. Um, you know, these things are super dim. So, um, so when you're finding them, you have to walk with no light or... You just need to collect everything you think might glow and either bring it into the dark or put it into a taco box and look at it uh, after it gets dark. Um, and then you need to be on a night with no moon because if there is a moon, then everything in the forest looks like it's glowing. Whereas if the forest is completely dark, then when you walk, the only things you see are glowing mycelium and glowing insects. So you'd be able to spot these luminescent things really easily. Uh, so if there's any moon at all, I'll look at the moon schedule, make sure that I'm going out after the moon is set or before the moon is, has risen. And, um, you know, this hunting in the middle of the night is pretty dangerous. So it helps to go in some sort of spot where it's like a handicapped access, like there's certain trails where people can take their wheelchairs on them. And that's really nice for a night walk because that way, you can feel under your feet if you start to go off the trail, you won't just fall into a river or off a cliff. And then when you're taking pictures to, turn, to make your camera more sensitive, you need to turn the ISO up. But the higher you turn up the ISO, then the grainier the photo becomes. So you wanna use the lowest ISO you can get away with um, and still see the mushroom well. So that usually means a pretty long exposure. Usually what I'll do is take a 30 second exposure at extremely high ISO, that's like 200,000 ISO. And that way I will be able to get just a very grainy photo that's extremely sensitive in only 30 seconds. And um, I'll be able to see which parts are glowing and set up a really good shot. And then I'll take my good shot after I've turned the ISO down a lot, maybe to something around ISO 800 and uh, that's a much longer exposure, usually like two and a half to five minutes. Uh, when you're walking at night through the woods, you should wear glasses uh, so you don't poke yourself in the eye. And I think I've gone through most There's of the a question, about, Alan, uh, about using yes. a yellow filter. A yellow filter. What about yellow filters? The, the individual one or whether you use a yellow filter. For your pictures. When, I, when I first started out taking mushrooms, I did use a yellow filter. Um, taking photos of like fluorescent things, I used the yellow filter. But uh, these days, I don't use any filter at all. I just, uh, just you know, use the, the straight camera. And uh, I found with the yellow filter, it was sort of a cool effect, but it wasn't really necessary unless I was using the 395 nanometer ultraviolet light. So uh, the yellow filter blocks a lot of the purple. So when I first started out, I would use one of these 395 lights. And um, the 395 lights have a lot of purple light that gets picked up. So then putting a yellow filter in front of the camera lens blocks that purple light. Unfortunately, your yellow filter also blocks a lot of other frequencies of, of light. 
And so I haven't used one in years. What I do now is I use a different color of ultraviolet. So the ultraviolet that I use now is 365 nanometers. And 365 is a much shorter wavelength than 395. And it's completely outside of what your eyes or the camera can pick up. And that means that I don't get a big purple cast in my photos. And uh, I don't need any kind of focus. Uh, it turns out that the difference between 395 and 365 is extremely big. Um, so if you go out with a 395 light, which is the purplish black lights, it's like the black lights you see at parties, you'll be pretty disappointed with the results compared to a 365 black light. So uh, 365, it looks a little bit more blue, um, but it's, uh, um, and they're, they're a bit more expensive. They're a little less common but it's really worth it. Um, so the light that I use now is made by Ingenious Designs and it costs about $100, uh, but it's a very bright 365 nanometer ultraviolet light that's focused into a nice beam. And so um, if I remember after the presentation, I'll find a link to that and show it on the screen. Um, but it's, uh, it's so much fun to walk around the woods at night with one of these flashlights. There's so much cool stuff that lights up. There's insects, there's plants, flowers, and of course, mushrooms. Um, so this one here is Tricholoma orontio olivaceum. And you remember with all those ones that were glowing in the dark because they were luminescent, they were always green. But this is fluorescent. So I shine the ultraviolet light down on the top. Um, in this particular one, they look like they're kind of illuminated from the middle because I um, opened the shutter for 10 seconds and then I shined the light down uh, for five seconds in the middle of each one of them. So it kind of illuminated them from inside. And then here's the Gallerina. And this one I took with a very wide angle macro lens. So it's the Laowa 15 millimeter macro lens. And so there's a lot of light coming into the lens from a lot of directions. So you get these uh, kind of cool lens flares. And you can see that a lot of plants will fluoresce red. So that leaf in the background, is, it's red because of the chlorophyll. And then this one is a redwood rooter, Coloriza umbanata. And it's kind of interesting, the two in the middle are the same species as the ones on the outside. They're just uh, a lot younger. So when these start out, they fluoresce uh, a very nice blue color. And then when they get older, they fluoresce sea green. Um, this one's really interesting um, because it's closely related to Gymnopolis, but it's a little bit outside of the genus Gymnopolis genetically. And then it also has a very viscid cap. So this um, will probably be a new genus named Albo Gymnopolis uh, and a new species, Albo Gymnopolis nanus. Uh, this one I found by walking around the woods at night with a uh, with the black light. They're extremely bright fluorescent mushrooms. Uh, they kind of look like a slimy tuberia uh, when you find them in white light. Um, they're extremely rare. And also I found that if you put potassium hydroxide on them to check the KOH reaction, you don't see much. But then with the ultraviolet light, it changes the color of the fluorescence quite a bit. So the parts that I have not put the fluoresce, um, not put the KOH are fluorescing sea green. And then where I put the KOH is fluorescing uh, more of like a almost radioactive lime green. Uh, now here's some I found in West Virginia uh, just uh, about six weeks ago. And this is kind of a cool mushroom. It's uh, Loradiomyces squamosis. And so Loradiomyces is in the Stripferiaceae family. And so they have really cool fluorescent gill edges. Um, so in this one, it's the chylocystidia and colocystidia that are fluorescing. So chylocystidia are microscopic cells on the gill edges. And then colocystidia are mi microscopic cells that are on the stem. So um, you can see that uh, by doing this, you know, these things look really cool. And then here's a real close up shot that I did. This one was about a hundred photos that I stacked um, so I could get good resolution, good depth of field, uh, even though it, the macro lens was right by the photo, right by the mushroom. And there's a lot of plants that are really cool in ultraviolet light too. So this is a Selegionella that I found a couple months ago in Veracruz, Mexico. And uh, this one's really cool in that it's fluorescent blue for most of it, but then the, the tips right where it's uh, glowing 
are fluorescent red. And that's probably because um, there are waxes that block the ultraviolet light. So it protects this, um, it's like an ancient lineage of ferns. It protects this plant from the sunlight. So then that way you can see, um, but you can see the, uh, the chlorophyll fluorescing um, in, in the places where they don't have waxes yet. So then after a couple of days, the waxes grow and then the, the waxes fluoresce blue. Another plant that fluoresces an unusual color is viola gobella. Uh, so these are found in point rays and the top of the leaf fluoresces blue and then the underside of the leaf fluoresces red. And that's because there's a couple different forms of chlorophyll uh, that are present and they have different forms on the top of the leaf and underside the, in the, underneath the leaf. So this ultraviolet photography and using ultraviolet lights is sort of like a chemical sensor. And just your eyesight, the colors you see is also a type of chemical sensor. Um, you know, you see, seeing the different things, different chemicals that are different colors. Uh, but with ultraviolet, then you can all of a sudden sense a whole bunch of different chemicals. And a lot of them are different. So some things that you can't see with the regular visible light become very obvious with ultraviolet light. So it makes it a lot of fun to walk through the woods at night, you know, almost like a, a whole new world that you're exploring. This one is Psilocybe subtropicalis. And so that is uh, one that I photographed in Veracruz um, about six weeks ago. And so this one also has uh, fluorescent gill edges and also some fluorescence on the stem. And that's probably because these mushrooms contain beta carbolines and beta carbolines are some of the, the same MAO inhibitors that are present in ayahuasca that cause the DMT to be orally active. So um, it's recently been discovered that psilocybin mushrooms also have beta carbolines in them. Here is a Chimenophyllum tendicimum from Mount Rainier. And so these are the, uh, these kind of cool white mushrooms and then they convert the white light into blue light. Uh, they convert ultraviolet light into blue light. And then here's some Athenaella. Um, this is from uh, Whidbey Island. So very close to Canada, you certainly have them there too. And so these are not particularly fluorescent uh, but they have very fluorescent stem bases. Uh, so it's just the stem base that fluoresces on these. You can see the whole photo is kind of purple and that's because I took this photo with the 395 nanometer ultraviolet light. So that's the less expensive, more common ultraviolet lights. Um, this picture would look a lot cooler if I took it with uh, the 365. And then here's Foliota spamosa. And I grabbed a bunch of these in the middle of the day, just brought them home. And then I put them on a mirror in the dark to photograph them. So you can see the reflection there. Uh, foliota spamosa are super common foliotas. They look a lot like Hypholoma fasciculare. So uh, people usually kind of mistake them for that. But Hypholoma fasciculare uh, has a drier cap and more purple spores. Here's some foliota spamosa from Michigan. and some Foliota Spamosa from California. This one I took uh, right about 5 p.m. So for the uh, bioluminescent mushrooms, they're so dim that you have to have it completely dark. So that you know, means astronomical dusk is what the astronomers call it, which means that it's completely dark. It's a couple hours after the sun sets uh, before it's you know, very, very dark. Whereas with fluorescent mushrooms, I usually start doing fluorescent photography about 3 p.m. if I'm down in a gully or 4 p.m. if I'm kind of up on a hillside because the fluorescence of these mushrooms are so bright that uh, you know you can compete pretty well with sunlight. Um, in this particular one, there's quite a bit of sunlight still. So I'm getting some fluorescence, but you can also see uh, the sun here. And then sometimes I'll just take like a black piece of velvet and throw it over my camera and then just take fluorescent photos that way. And if there's like a little bit of light that seeps through, it doesn't really affect anything. Here is Cortinarius cydelliae. Uh, so it's one of those really viscid Cortinarius, uh, kind of like this one, because the cap looks like a tiger's eye. Uh, this one's uh, from Samoa Dunes in Northern California. And then another one that's uh, really famous for being fluorescent is Hypholoma fasciculare, which was that one. 
Um, this one is Miatomyces the simulans, so it's kind of unusual and it fluoresces blue. And normally, when you see these things in wood chips, you would think they're an agrosibi. They um, they look a lot like agrosibi. They have the same spore color, but with ultraviolet light, agrosibi are kind of boring. Whereas these things are bright blue and ultraviolet. They're also a little bit more brittle than agrosibi. There's a lot of Miatomyces species all over the west coast of North America. Uh, but they're pretty mysterious because they're kind of hard to find. These here, uh, I have no idea what's going on here, but this is a leaf. And so in white light, you can see that there are some kind of brown spots in, on this leaf. And then with ultraviolet, you can see they fluoresce a very bright orange. And so at first I thought maybe it was a lichen or a bacteria. So I brought the leaf back and did some microscopy with it. And I couldn't see anything under the microscope other than just leaf cells. So there was no bacteria around. There was nothing indicating there was any lichens or fungi. So I'm not sure what was going on here, but I actually see this pretty often. This photo is from Michigan. Uh, here's some others from Michigan. And I see it in California, all up and down the West Coast as well. Here is a Ganoderma lobotum. So these things fluoresce blue, and then they have algae on them, and the algae has chlorophyll, and the chlorophyll fluoresces red. Here, uh, this one is a Foliota subsulfurea. Uh, it has really cool, uh, very bright gill edges. And here's some hiddenum species. A lot of hiddenums are fluorescent. And uh, Again, this is the 395 uh, nanometer light, so that's why you have all these purple tones. It looked way better in 365. Here is a hemimycena. A lot of hemimycenas uh, look very blue uh, in ultraviolet. Here's some Hyphalema fasciculare from Humboldt County. And you can see, again, the, those mysterious orange spots on the leaf. Um, and then a lot of grasses fluoresce, kind of a combination of blue and purple. So you're seeing that on the left as well. Uh, so the common name of this one is sulfur tuft, and they're extremely bright. You can see these things fluorescing from 100 meters away. Also hypholema fasciculare. And the same thing again. A little cluster, a fasciculate cluster of hypoloma fasciculare. And then there's also fluorescent microscopes. So I took a gill from hypoloma fasciculare and threw it under one of these Zeiss microscopes. Um, and you can see in here on the left is the lamellar trema. So that's the inside of the gill. And on the right are the chrysocystidia and basidia and basidioles. So not everything in the gill fluoresces, it's just certain cells, but you can use a fluorescence microscope to see which cells they are. You can also use, use a regular microscope and shine a black light, um, either through the microscope or to shine a black light on the, on the um, stage. And that works really well at lower magnifications. When you start magnifying like 400 times, you need, would need a really bright ultraviolet light to make that work. Pretty much everything in Hypholoma is very fluorescent. This one is Hypholoma lateridium. And one of my favorites is Hypholoma marginatum, or they also call Hypholoma dispersum, which should be really common in BC. That's the little mycenoid Hypholoma. It looks really cool. Here is Cyptotrauma aspirata. And this is one's kind of unique because it fluoresces a, a bright orange color. That one I found in Texas. And then here's one that had no name when I found it, but has a name now. This is um, Callistosporium pseudophileum. And you'll notice that everything in Callistosporium is really fluorescent. The most common Callistosporium is Callistosporium purpureum marginatum um, or Callistosporium luteo olivaceum. Uh, all of those things are super fluorescent. Uh, these are some photos that I took in Big Thicket, Texas. And these things are super bright. You know, they're really small, but just like panning a black light around the forest floor, you can see them from a long ways away. They're really attention getting. One genus that's famous for being super fluorescent is Rusula. In fact, just about all the Rusulas are fluorescent. You get a few different colors, but this is a Rusula I found on a night hike in uh, Gainesville, Florida. 
And so these Rusulans are giving us a real nice blue. Here's Rusula Zelleri from, um, from Humboldt County, California. You probably get these under spruce in British Columbia as well. So it's kind of cool and that they have this nice maroon cap. And then the maroon cap turns blue and ultraviolet. And then you're getting some green colors out of the gills. Here's another Rusula from Florida. These ones uh, give you some nice purple colors. And then some of the puffballs are pretty fluorescent. Uh, also, a lot of puffballs are not fluorescent. So just going over the specimen table after a fungus fair is a really fun thing to do with an ultraviolet light. And so I went over the specimen table at Midwest Mushroom Camp in Michigan, and I found um, that most of the puffballs didn't do anything, but these one lycoperdon collections, which look really similar to the other ones, but were clearly a different species, were really br bright fluorescent if you cut them open. And this one is, uh, let's see, I forget the name of this crust, uh, but you get a really cool uh, purple color with ultraviolet. I think it was in the Zaleri always. Uh, but not just mushrooms are fluorescent. You also have a lot of uh, fluorescent organisms. So millipedes are really famous for being fluorescent. And there's a lot of different species of fluorescent millipedes. Uh, like in California, we have two common fluorescent millipedes. Um, in the Seattle area, there's also two common fluorescent millipedes, but they're completely different species. Uh, this particular fluorescent millipede is from Texas. Uh, this one I like quite a bit because the um, it's mostly just the legs that fluoresce. And so if you ever see something like this, the really fun thing to do is take out your cell phone and make a video of it uh, because the cell phone video of uh, something like this just running around with the ultraviolet light is always uh, looks super cool. Here's a cactus in my friend's yard. Um, this was the cactus in white light, same cactus in ultraviolet. Um, and then here is ultraviolet with an orange filter over the uh, over the camera. So um, you can block some of those blues with an orange filter and get some different effects. I usually don't use those filters anymore. Another thing that is super fluorescent is scorpions. And so this is a Centeroides from Flagstaff, Arizona. And so scorpions, you can see them from you know, 100 meters away because they have these really brightly fluorescent beta carbolines in their exoskeleton. Uh, or here's one with the orange filter. And then here's one I photographed uh, in Arizona, you know, Alabama, uh, at the Alabama Mushroom Festival uh, just about six weeks ago. And this one, you can see there's really good detail on the scorpion because I used a uh, macro lens. And so I was able to capture all the little tiny bumps and everything. Uh, club moss looks kind of cool with ultraviolet. Uh, here it is. Uh, this was uh, the 395, but you get a really cool pink shade. It's like party moss. And then there's a lot of very fluorescent lichens. Uh, so this one is one of the more common ones on the West Coast, and it is called Oprolepium. And so one thing that's really common with fluorescent lichens is when you look at them with white light, the whole stick or the whole rock looks very similar. But if you look really closely, you can see some very subtle changes. And those are actually different species of lichens. And so these subtle changes that indicate the different species of lichens happen to be very obvious in the ultraviolet light. So that's Ocrelechia. And here's some more Ocrelechia. It grows on sticks. And then here's a Chirospora socialis. This is one that only grows on rocks. Uh, looks really cool in the daytime. And then here is the 395 nanometer ultraviolet light and 365 nanometer ultraviolet light. Uh, so 98% of, uh, of the time, 365 looks better. Uh, but occasionally 395 can look pretty cool. Uh, here's one that I like quite a bit. This is Tucker Monopsis. Um, so this photo I took it right at sunset. And so it's a wide angle macro lens. So that way you can see the, all the background of the forest, but you can also see all of the fine detail uh, of the lichen. 
And then I took the same picture, but I illuminated the lichen with LED light instead of uh, the ultraviolet light. So these are kind of cool because they look like almost like a jellyfish or something at night. Uh, this is a different one. Uh, this is Tucker Monopsis. Uh, also very cool looking lichen uh, from the West Coast. And then here's Usnia, uh, which doesn't really glow too much in ultraviolet, but makes up for it just by being look like, uh, looking like it came from another planet. All right, Usnia strigosa. And then here's a polypore that I found at Mount Rainier. And this uh, polypore is only very slightly fluorescent, just a little bit blue. Uh, but it was covered in pink spots. And in regular white light, those pink spots are still there, but it happens to be very fluorescent. So this was a pretty old polypore. And this was uh, some very fluorescent bacteria that was starting to grow on the polypore. So I got just a couple more slides for you. Um, and then I will maybe show you a couple things online and then uh, take some questions. Um, but uh, 365 and 395 nanometer light, you hear me talk about that a lot because it's super important which one you use. And uh, you pretty much always want a 365. Um, let's see. So there's a bunch of different 365s. You really want the bright one. If you're doing cell phone photography, it's kind of nice to have one with a wider beam because that way the whole subject is illuminated at once. If you're doing the kind of photography where you set up a DSLR and then open the shutter for a few seconds and pan the light around the subject, uh, then you, you're really best off with one that's a tighter beam uh, because black lights with tighter beams will let you see fluorescent things at much greater distances. Uh, but uh, you know, cell phone photography actually works really well with fluorescent things uh, because you have a lot of light to work with and cell phones work pretty well with low light. Um, it usually looks best in night mode. So that way um, night mode kind of like accumulates light where it needs it, but then it stops you from blowing out the highlights. So uh, things look a lot better in night mode very often. Um, but you know, because the ultraviolet lights, you know, these days the black lights I use have a 15 watt LED, which is really a very bright ultraviolet light. And so because there's so much light to play with, you don't need a long exposure. And so cell phones actually work really well. Um, but my last slide here is uh, the, the spectrum. And so down at the bottom, you see the whole light spectrum. And so on the right, you have infrared, so that's invisible and that's heat, uh, or that light creates heat when it hits you. And then you have all the different colors of light and that's measured in nanometers. So 700 nanometer light would be red light. Your uh, glowing mushrooms, the luminescent mushrooms are all at 530. So that's why all of the mushrooms are um, that same shade of green. And then purple light will be about 400. And if it gets even more purple than purple light, you won't be able to see it anymore. And then we call it ultraviolet. So these fluorescent things, when ultraviolet light hits them, they um, release, like a photon comes in and then they release another photon that has lower energy. And that means that it has a longer wavelength and it comes back in the visible spectrum. So that's why you see all these different colors. Uh, but light is really just part of the electromagnetic spectrum, not much different than X-rays or gamma rays. Um, so the, the ones on the left of visible light start to get more dangerous. So ultraviolet is pretty safe if it's really close to purple, but the farther you get into ultraviolet, the more dangerous it becomes. So uh, we go very far into ultraviolet, ultraviolet, you get sunburns and cancer very easily, uh, very quickly. And then X-rays and gamma rays, those all cause cancer. Uh, but then when you go to the right, so longer wave uh, than visible light, these things are all pretty safe because they're all very low. So infrared, microwave, radar, radio, cell phones, all that stuff, um, those are safe electromagnetic, um, safe parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So it looks like I have just a, um, let's see, uh, I have just a couple more, uh, couple more minutes here, uh, and then I'll take questions, but I wanted to show you a couple things online. 
So I'm just going to share my screen and, um, and we'll take a look um, at, at a couple things here. Uh, let's see if we have, yeah. So this is a really cool iNaturalist project. Uh, this is called the UV Fluorescent Organisms Project. And so whenever I find anything that's fluorescent in any way, I'll photograph it, upload the photos to iNaturalist, go into my observation and uh, go ahead and uh, add it to this project. And that way, when I need to make a talk on ultraviolet uh, you know, fluorescent stuff, I can just pull up all my photos really quick. And it's a permanent record that documents this fluorescence. So you can see that out of all the people, you know, it's 231 people that contributed to this project. Uh, out of all of us, we have found over a thousand different fluorescent species, um, 2,300 observations. And you know, a lot of stuff that you wouldn't expect is fluorescent. Like if you have a white dog, your dog will be fluorescent. Possums are super fluorescent. Uh, but you can click through here and see what the most uh, commonly observed fluorescent, uh, fluorescent uh, things are. And then you can also see the people that do the most fluorescent photography. And that is by far Damon Teague. Uh, Damon is super cool. Um, he's from the Bay Area. And he's been doing this ultraviolet photography stuff out in nature longer than just about anybody else, I think. He kind of gave everyone the idea uh, that ultraviolet light was really cool and a, a lot of fun and scientifically valuable as well. And started posting it all over social media. And uh, now lots of people have been doing it. Um, this lady, Puffer Chang, I got to meet her for the first time in Texas last week. And she is a professional photographer, um, or at least carries professional gear and does really good work, uh, often with flowers. She even has ultraviolet flashes and all sorts of ultraviolet lights. Um, and then you can also go over here and see the most commonly observed species. So you can see the sulfur tuff is the most popular uh, fluorescent target. Whereas you have these millipedes and uh, scorpions and uh, looks like some, some of these things in the ocean like tide pooling uh, are really good with fluorescent light as well. Uh, another really cool thing to do on iNaturalist is just to identify mushrooms. And so I like to identify a whole bunch of these every day. And so I have this URL kind of points me to the ID interface. And so I go in here and I dig the mushrooms of uh, wherever I am. So usually like if I'm in Texas, I'll identify all the mushrooms uh, in Texas right now. We'll try like uh, identifying all the mushrooms in British Columbia. And this is pretty cool because you're helping out the people that are around you. Uh, when the season's really good, I kind of zoom in and I only identify things that are found in my city because it'd be like a full-time job to identify everything in California when the season's good. But then when the season tails off, I can do the whole state in just a few minutes per day. Uh, but this is pretty cool because you can see what everyone's finding um, pretty much in real time in British Columbia. And, um, and so you can kind of go through now, some of these observations, you know, they're not really... The, the photos aren't really that good. These are probably not mushroom people, but there's people that are out, you know, out enjoying nature and then they see a mushroom and they don't realize that it's kind of rotten. It's hard to identify or if they don't photograph the underside, it's hard, hard to identify. They think it's foliar to Aravella and it definitely could be, but could be a lot of other things too. Um, so I'm going to say Agaricales because I don't think you can even tell what genus this is. And we'll say, no, not enough information to say it's foliota. And then we have these nice Ganodermas. I think this really is Ganoderma applinatum because it has this dull surface on the top. And it's, on, it's pretty common in conifer uh, up in uh, British Columbia. So I just hit A to agree with that. Uh, this one's a little thicker. Let's see, I think this would be Fomis excavatus because uh, that's the Fomis that occurs. Um, I'm not totally sure though, so maybe I'll just skip that and let somebody who knows the British Columbia polypores a little more. Uh, this one's in Intermediate Versicolor. I am suspicious about this being a sterium. Uh, the reason is because see how the edges are orange? So Intermediate Versicolor doesn't really have orange edges. Now, if I had taken a photo of the underside, it'd be super easy to know for sure. Um, 
but they, we just have the top here, but just because of those orange edges, I'm going to call it Sterium hirsutum, which is what we call our really common Sterium on the West Coast. But actually, Sterium hirsutum is only in Europe, and the super common Sterium on the West Coast that you see 100 times a day has not been named yet. Another tough one, because they didn't uh, photo, photo be on your side. Uh, but you can see it's um, it's kind of cool to flip through here and see what's being been found recently. And then um, another cool thing is they have the exact location you can zoom in on. So this is the accuracy over here. And here the accuracy is 15 meters. So if someone finds something rare and uh, you want to go and photograph the same thing, you can go and see exactly where they photographed it to the nearest 15 meters. So if you walk out there, and you can see this was photographed three days ago. It's probably still there. And it's a pretty good spot for the species. You can see they're, they're kind of all over this place. And then if you don't want to give away the exact location of what you find, then when you create an observation, you can obscure the coordinates. And that tells people where it is, but only to the nearest 10 miles. So then your, your observation is still scientifically about, um, accurate and you know, still helpful, but people can't figure out exactly where you are. Here is Fomatopsis mountsii. I agree with that. So I'll hit agree. I don't know if this is Fomus fomentarius, so that one they call uh, Garricon. Well, it's definitely not Fomus fomentarius. That's European, but it could be the... Uh, Chromatopsis epicinalis, I suspect that that's what it is. Uh, anyways, it's also kind of zoom in on certain groups. Like if you're really good with pineolis, you can only identify pineolis in here. And then uh, you can see all the pineolis that are in uh, British Columbia and kind of flip through that way. Let's see, I think that's uh, about all I wanted to show you online. It's also kind of fun is to take out all the filters here. We're identifying mushrooms for the whole world. The, um, and this is really cool because if you see there's a part of the world that has really good mushrooms, like maybe it's kind of dry or maybe you got uh, heavy frost in British Columbia, you go on here and identify stuff from the whole world or you can do all of North America. And when you see a, um, some mushrooms that are in really good shape in a place that has a lot of rain, then you can just go check the weather forecast for that place. And if you see more rain in the coming week, then just buy a plane ticket and you can take a really awesome mushroom vacation. I know for sure that there will be a lot of mushrooms out there. So um, I use this a lot for deciding where I want to go. Uh, or even more locally, you know, if the season's really rough and it's, uh, there'll, there'll be certain pockets, they're, they're a lot more humid. On the West Coast, a lot of it's fog drip. So what I will do is... You know, in the winter, when there's good rains, there's mushrooms everywhere. But in the summer, there's only mushrooms where the fog hits and drops all the fog off the trees. So what I'll do is I'll search for agaricales, so guild mushrooms. And I'll do that search only like in, you know, within 100 miles of my house and only in the months of August and September, like the driest months. And then I'm only seeing the mushrooms that are fruiting in the driest months. And you'll see that they cluster, they're not random at all. They cluster and they cluster in places that get irrigated, like maybe a graveyard or some kind of irrigated, you know, public park or the fog drip areas. And so then you can go out there and even in the very middle of the summer, you'll just see fog like drain streaming off the trees and uh, the ground will be really wet with the mushrooms all over the place. Uh, so that is, uh, that is what I have for you. Uh, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to hang out here and, uh, and answer questions uh, for as long as you, you want to hang out and talk. Thank okay. you very much, uh, Alan. Thank you. That was outstanding. What incredible photos. Thanks. I think we can... Can you stop sharing now or do you want to keep that open for the moment? No, oh, there we go. Yep. All right. I'm going to get everybody onto gallery. And uh, I'll, that is terrific. Now, I, I'd like to open, uh, already there's been some questions coming in uh, and comments. Sophie, you're one of our new members. You asked one of the first questions about something with diving. Can you mention that? Sophie, 
If you want to talk, just press oh, yeah, your yeah, space yeah. I bar. Think, I think, yeah, okay. So I think he uh, answered my question. Uh, and it was about um, the 365 versus the older, like the 395, where we had to wear yellow lenses. All right. Oh, yeah. Um, and I'm going to answer your question just a little bit more because I also somebody um, I also promised that I would tell you which lights I recommend. So I'm going to turn on the share for just a few more seconds. Um, and so um, the light that I like the best is this Ingenious Designs uh, 365 nanometer Convoy C8. Now Convoy C8s are these uh, pretty good quality flashlights that get um, mass manufactured in, in China. Uh, but they, um, with, they're not necessarily ultraviolet. So other companies will buy like a carton or a crate of Convoy C8s and then they'll replace the LEDs with ultraviolet LEDs and, and sell them. And that's what this company here has done. Uh, so they're really nice, high quality aluminum flashlights. They, um, they're weather sealed and um, they take the 18650 batteries, which are like the same batteries that make up a Tesla battery pack. They're like rechargeable lithium batteries. Um, and so these, uh, the really nice lights. And so, uh, this one also has a really tight beam. So they have like a really nice high powered, uh, LED. Another thing to look at with the lights is they have this filter in the front. Let's see if I can show that. You can almost see it here. Uh, if you look at a good quality light, the uh, the front of the light looks black because they have a filter that blocks on um, visible light and that gives you a very pure ultraviolet light. So a good light will have uh, have that. This one is three watts of radiant energy, which is a huge amount of power. Um, and that one's really cool. But this one you have to order uh, online from this website. Uh, you can also, there's also some you can get on Amazon. Uh, one that works pretty well. It's almost as good, but a little bit broader beam. It's this UV Beast. So this 365 uh, nanometer UV Beast. You can see it has the filter in the front and $80, uh, 80 US dollars. Um, so that's something you can just get off of Amazon. Those are really good. They have a very slightly wider beam than the, the Convoy C8, uh, but there's still a pretty tight focused beam. So it's, it's pretty good for distance. Uh, there's also a whole bunch of little mini flashlights and they're cool, but they are not nearly as bright as a, uh, as one of the more expensive ones. So, um, if you're going to get one, I really recommend spending at least, at least 80 or a hundred dollars and get a really bright one because there's so much more fun at night. Over here, this is a 385 to 395. This is the kind that you probably don't want. They're less expensive. They're extremely purple and a whole lot less stuff fluoresces. Uh, but there's some really cheap ones, like these 12 ones, $12 ones. Um, th they work, but I don't, don't really recommend them. Uh, out of all these, it's the UV Beast, uh, this one here, uh, that I would order if you're gonna get something from Amazon. All right, thank you. Um, uh, Joey, you were mention you were asking something about ASCO my seats, and I wondered if you could also um, make a go at the orange showing spots on the leaf, considering your interest in endophytes. Joey. Oh yeah, sorry, David. Uh, sorry, I missed those spots on the leaves. Was that earlier on? Uh, about. Three halfway through, three quarters of the way through. Oh, I can um, pull, pull those up. And you were also saying something about ascomites seeds. Yeah, Alan, I was just wondering. Um, I've only been outside a few times a night looking for fungi. Um, have you ever noticed any ascomites seeds glowing? Mostly lichens. Oh. Okay. Um, so not most lichens don't glow. I would say about 5% of the lichens that, that I find uh, react with ultraviolet, but those 5% are really spectacular. You know, they're, they're lichens, so you get these super intricate shapes. 
And the most common color is bright yellow, just like super beautiful bright yellow. But then a lot of them are also orange and those are usually a little bit dimmer. And then a lot of them are also blue. So, um, so the, those are the colors I usually get off lichens, but most of the cup fungi do not fluoresce very much. That doesn't mean they won't fluoresce at all. Like a lot of stuff is very vaguely fluorescent or just slightly fluorescent, but if you shine a really bright ultraviolet source at it and use a long exposure, you can still get a spectacular photo out of something that is just vaguely fluorescent. Um, but usually it's uh, the city of my seats that I notice are like, you know, when I run the, the ultraviolet light over the specimen table um, at a fungus fair, it's, it's usually uh, the Presidio my seats that, uh, that light up the most. Um, but really quick, um, I will show you the leaf spots and you can try to um, take a look at them and see uh, if you have any uh, opinion on them. But these, uh, these leaves, uh, if you look, this is what the leaf looks like in, in white light. And then in ultraviolet light, you can see these bright spots. So uh, flipping back and forth, you can see that you do kind of get these reddish spots on the leaf. Uh, but I scoped them, uh, you know, 400 and 1,000 times, and I couldn't notice anything that was any different between these orange spots of the leaf and the other parts of the leaf that just had plant cells. And also there's these yellow ones. So different leaves will be orange or yellow. Uh, they, they're found near each other but not always on the same leaf. Uh, so I think it's something different going on. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a mystery to me what, uh, what could be making these leaves uh, have these fluorescent spots. Oh, interesting. No, I, sorry, I missed those slides, but yeah, that's interesting. I, um, yeah, a few times in the last year, I've wanted to buy um, like a, a UV flashlight, but I was, I was sort of inundated with all the cheap options on Amazon. So I appreciate those, um, those recommendations and yeah, maybe I'll, I'll try to go at one of these nights. Yeah. And you know, even if there's no mushrooms out, it's still really fun to walk around the night with ultraviolet lights. Um, one really cool place to go would be a botanical work garden because a lot of flowers are spectacular. And, um, and it's probably, you know, after a frost, there's not too many insects, but if there were insects, some insects are extremely bright. Uh, so, there's always rocks. Uh, there's always something to see where uh, all the violet lights. Well, that's great. Yeah, thank you again. And yeah, I, I know someone who, uh, in his free time, he looks for Sasquatch. And he was, I, I never heard of going out with a UV light before, but he said you see all, all sorts of amazing things, including animal urine and things you would normally never see. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Joey, mm -hmm. uh, you also mentioned Xylaria hypoxylon being bioluminescent. I've only read that. Yeah, I've, I've never confirmed that. I've, um, but I, I saw Alan, I'm not sure if that was um, Biscognioxia, but it looked like you had some sort of hypoxylon-like fungus in one of your slides. Oh, you know, I do have some cool photos of Xylaria uh, fluorescing. Um, though it's not a spectacular color, it's kind of a cool shade of blue. I think it's the, asexual spores that, that give you the blue color. Um, but uh, I've checked Xylaria uh, for bioluminescence many times. And I've never seen it glowing and I've never seen a photo of it glowing. So um, I think if you use an extremely sensitive instrument, you know, there's, um, there's instruments um, that, are, that detect light and they're thousands of times more sensitive than the eye because they, uh, they have like a photomultiplier tube and then they're connected to a really, uh, really sensitive like, photodiode type thing. Um, what Brian Perry told me, I, I guess it has to be true because he's an expert, uh, but he says that every living thing um, gives, uh, is actually giving a little bit of light out. So if you just throw like some redwood needles or some leaves or some fruit, any living thing, you throw it in a sensitive enough light detector, um, it will give you some light. And uh, I, I guess it's true or else he wouldn't have said it. But, um, you know, I, I think also like, um, you know, there's a lot of species of Mycena that are extremely dim. Like uh, even the very common species of Mycena, like Mycena hematopus, they're super dim, but the mycelium is glowing. So you can get like glowing photos of just the stem bases. 
Uh, but I think Xyleria hypoxylon falls into that group where it's not sensitive enough for a camera to pick it up, but it is sensitive enough for um, for one of these devices to pick it up. But I don't know if we'll ever find one. But you know, maybe if you check it out, you'll find a, a brighter one. Okay, um, I think Jeffrey has a couple of questions. If Jeffrey, you can ask uh, Alan about them. Hey, Alan, um, I just had one question about uh, visible light versus ultraviolet light. So I have a flashlight that's around 420 nanometers. Um, would that work for viewing um, autofluorescence in fungi if I used like a yellow filter to block the excitation light? And then I yes. had another question. Oh, sorry. And then I had another question just about the safety. Like, is it necessary to wear eye protection to protect the reflected UV from getting into your eye? Yeah, those are both really good questions. And yeah, you can do autofluorescence at lots of different wavelengths. And um, that's something I'd like to try is just to get, you know, those like really bright 420 nanometer LEDs are dirt cheap. And then you just get a filter and it's, you'll see a whole other group of fluorescent stuff, you know, maybe stuff that's not fluorescent in ultraviolet, but it's fluorescent in blue. Um, so that's probably a, a really cool thing to carry with you if you're walking around the woods at night is various filters and various lights. And, um, you know, fluorescence always um, gives you uh, a wavelength that is longer than what you put out. So you couldn't, um, you wouldn't expect to like shine a red light and get anything because that's already the long end of the spectrum. But any color short of red, in theory, could be used for fluorescence uh, with a filter. Um, and then about safety. So the shorter the wavelength is, the more dangerous it is. And so, um, you know, the three, the safest ultraviolet light will be 395. And then slightly less safe, but still pretty safe is the 365. Um, I find that I think they're pretty safe, but I wouldn't shine it in my eye directly. And also I find that if I'm like kind of close to an object that reflects a lot of ultraviolet light and I shine the light at it, I get this really weird feeling in my eye. And actually it's my cornea is fluorescing and it feels very uncomfortable and people just don't tend to like that. It's probably also not very good for your eye, uh, but it's nothing like the shorter wavelengths like 254. Um, or some of the rocks, the, the, the wavelengths that people use for minerals and rocks. Some of um, some of those are like 235. That stuff gets pretty dangerous. So um, if I have glasses, uh, then I'll wear them. And just about any glasses will, will block 365. Uh, but if I don't have glasses, I don't worry about it. Uh, but what I do is just kind of, instead of shining the light on things that are close, I spend most of my time shining the light off into the distance on far away things. And if I notice, like if I shine it at a rock at my feet and I kind of notice my cornea is fluorescing, get this weird feeling in your eye, then I point it away real quick. And that, that seems to work fine. Um, but certainly for maximum safety, you, um, any kind of ultraviolet blocking glasses will work. And what you can do is just take the glasses and hold them up to the light and then hold something fluorescent behind the glasses. And with just about every kind of glasses I've tried, they will block just about 100% of the ultraviolet light. So you should just have like a shadow passing across whatever fluorescent thing. Um, and just like a, a white piece of paper is perfect for that because white typing paper is super fluorescent. So if there's any ultraviolet at all passing through, you'll be able to see it really well. Um, so I test them that way, but just uh, just about all the glasses on the market do block ultraviolet really well. I think that's because polycarbonate has a, a really good cutoff right after the visible uh, spectrum. Okay, there's another question from Angelique. Could you ask Alan your question, Angelique? Just push the, the space bar. Yeah. Hi, yeah, I was just wondering why, um, why they glow in UV light. Like why did fungus develop that ability? Was it so that they could attract more insects or? That's a really good question. And um, um, that's a really good question. And I've thought about this a lot. Um, one thing is that, um, I think I'm back though. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. 
So while you do get ultraviolet in nature, you never get pure ultraviolet. You only get ultraviolet when in combination with uh, a whole lot of white light. So there really isn't a good reason for things in nature to be fluorescent um, because it's, it's not like, you know, we have our pure ultraviolet lights. Um, it's true that a lot of animals do see ultraviolet, but that's not really fluorescence either. That's just, uh, you know, maybe like animals, like, you know, they, they see ultraviolet because that helps them see things like mouse urine and, and things like that. Um, but like I noticed, I noticed that the um, reproductive part of the fungi is the part that tends to glow or most of your photos depict that. So it seems to make sense that perhaps the reason why they glow in UV is to attract insects and therefore get more reproductive success, but that's just a theory. Yeah, so people definitely or? say that about the glowing mushrooms, um, just the luminescent mushrooms, because if, mm -hmm. if it's pitch dark at night and there's a glowing mushroom, that's gonna be super attractive for an insect. Uh, I haven't heard people say that about fluorescent stuff, but that'd be a really cool thing to study. Uh, my theory on fluorescence is that fluorescent chemicals are extremely common in nature and that uh, mushrooms and fungi in general are just full of crazy chemicals. And so um, when you have a mushroom that might have hundreds of random chemicals in it, or not random, but you know, it seems random to us, uh, you know, some of those are going to be fluorescent some percentage of the time. And so I think it's just by chance that you get fluorescence. Um, but um, it, it does definitely possible that it's not by chance and there's, uh, there's some reason for it. Okay, thanks. Jason, can you hear me, Alan? Well, I'm sorry, I think it's cut out for a second. Um, uh, say again. A question from the Facebook page, are most of the glow-in-the-dark mushrooms Mycena? Ah, uh, yes. Most of the glow-in-the-dark mushrooms are Mycena. Um, there's about 100 species of Mycena that are known to glow in the dark and probably over 100 left to discover. So you got a couple hundred Mycena. And then you have the Pinella stipticus. And genetically, Pinella stipticus is right next to Mycena. It's basically a polypore that's almost a mycena. So um, I think that's the same kind of, I think it has the same genes there. And then you have some stuff that's not related quite as much, like Ophelotus and Armillaria. Um, it's kind of interesting that uh, I think all of the bioluminescent mushrooms are white spored. So um, you, know, you never see any dark spored uh, luminescent mushrooms. Um, but yeah, certainly not not everything is Mycena. And then also in Ecuador, I was seeing some stuff that definitely was not Mycena, but was glowing. Uh, but yeah, Mycena does it more than anything else. Uh, as far as I can tell, they're all wood lovers, so lignin de de decomposers. So I've never seen any uh, bioluminescent fungi that were ectomycorrhizal. They're all saprotrophic. And maybe that's because they're using the insects to bring their spores or mycelium to new substrates. There are two other questions on the Facebook page I see coming up uh, from Matt Lyon, which I believe you have answered already. Curious if the psilocybin cyanescence are bioluminescent. It's a dark spot. Uh, no, nothing, uh, nothing in psilocybin is uh, bioluminescent. Now, uh, some of the uh, psilocybin mushrooms are fluorescent. Uh, especially gymnopilus, like gymnopilus luteofolius is beautiful in ultraviolet light. Um, and then also um, a lot of the psilocybes have fluorescent chylosystidia. So if you're just like walking around the woods at night, trying to look for psilocybe with, with a ultraviolet light, you're not going to see them. They're, they'll look like shadows. But if you are walking, um, if you shine the light directly at the gills, they look really cool because just the gill edges light up. Um, so you saw that uh, psilocybe photo I had uh, kind of earlier in my talk. That also is really, um, you know, re really cool looking, but you're not going to see that until you're looking like you're shining it right on the gills. So, um, so you can't use uh, black lights to hunt uh, psilocybe, but you can use black lights to take really cool pictures of psilocybe once you found them. 
there's an earlier question from Sophie regarding the link for this uh, digital uh, single lens reflex beam 365 light. Uh, I, th I think she didn't get it the first time. So do, would you have the link for that light? Um, I posted it in yeah. the chat. Um, oh, okay. I think I posted both the, uh, the Ingenious Designs one and the, uh, the one that's available on Amazon. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, let me know if that didn't go through for some reason, and I'm happy to send it again. Yeah, I see it over here, and I have recorded the chat as well. Cool. Uh, all right, so we should be able to pick it up. Otherwise, I'll contact you. All right. Mm -hmm. um, there was. Marina uh, had a question whether any bioluminescent mushrooms on Vancouver Island. Yeah, that's a good question. And one thing that would be kind of cool is to make a list of bioluminescent mushrooms and then look up the iNaturalist uh, taxon numbers for that list. And then you can construct a URL where you could point it at any part of the world, um, large or small, and it would list all of the bioluminescent mushrooms that have uh, iNaturalist observations there. Uh, another way to do that would just be to search through, uh, it's kind of distracting hearing your voices. Um, and also another way to do that would just be to search through um, with uh, Vancouver Island with the um, for that project, the uh, ultraviolet fluorescent organisms project, and that way, um, that way you could uh, find stuff that way. Um, sorry, I forgot the question though. Oh, oh, which uh, yeah, I remember which uh, bioluminescent mushrooms you have on Vancouver Island. I think Pinella stipticus. Could you guys go outside to talk, please? Can that be repeated again, please? Um, so on Vancouver Island, yeah, you have um, Pinella stipticus, and then the other ones are going to be Mycena species. So the Mycena species that are bioluminescent on um, Pinella uh, on, Van on Vancouver Island are going to be like Mycena hematopus and um, let's see our other ones. There's really a lot of uh, common West Coast Mycena species that are not very bioluminescent, but they're all, they're like really um, the mycelium is very is very dim. So like Mycena maculata is a really common one you'll find in Vancouver, and that one is bioluminescent but very dim in the mycelium. And really, uh, a lot of your very common Mycenas will be uh, will be dim but actually glowing and it's almost always only in the stem base um, or in places where the uh, in places where they're been damaged by insects so like mycena hematopus can glow in the spots where the insects bite the cap um, but usually just the stem base justin clark asks an interesting question justin do you want to ask it yourself <laughs> uh, just pretty straight question is just uh, do any of them glow after you dry them no nothing glows after a dr they dry they have to be nice and fresh uh, but a lot of stuff is fluorescent after it's been dried interesting thanks Alan uh, I think that's the end of the questions any more coming uh I can't see any on the Facebook page at the moment. And uh, Mar Gert. Martin has a question. M Martin? Yeah, actually, I do. Um, hey, Alan, uh, great talk. The um, You mentioned that the, the Gymnopolis luteifolius um, fluoresces. Is that, a, is that a good characteristic to use for to confirm an ID? Because sometimes we've got like saponaceous or some of the other ones, and and you know in the field it's pretty hard. Is is that a reliable ID? No, because all of the gymnopilus are very fluorescent. Okay, um, so it's possible they might fluoresce differently. So if you had a bunch, you could start to you know com compare them. But in general, gymnopilus uh, tend to be super fluorescent. Uh, also, a lot of lookalikes for gymnopilus, like Hyphaloma and Foliota. 
also super fluorescent mushrooms. Um, so um, I wouldn't really use it for that without kind of doing some careful looking into how the fluorescence is. So I noticed that in Ganoderma, you can uh, ID them pretty well with fluorescence. For example, Ganoderma low bottom is always super blue. And then Aplonatum is more like patchy blue. And then Suge and those varnished ones, you get really awesome yellows and green colors um, in the varnished parts. So um, they do seem to be pretty useful in Ganoderma. And I think as more people pay more attention to these different, uh, these different fluorescent mushrooms that more taxonomically significant uh, ultraviolet reactions will be found. And some of the quaternarius can't be identified if you don't look at the ultraviolet reaction before you dry them. Um, actually, one just to follow up on that. So, where is that information? Is that available anywhere? Like on that quaternary on the quaternarius that you just mentioned. Um, uh, the quaternarius I mentioned that are some new species described by Joe Amarati from uh, west, west Coast of the USA. And um, it was the Cortinarius flophobosilis clade. And there was a paper published, it was pretty recent about that. And it's an open access paper. And they have a, a whole bunch about the ultraviolet reactions in, in that. Um, Cortinarius are pretty cool mushrooms with ultraviolet. Um, a lot of them are just on the stem base to get ultraviolet reactions or you have like a lot of them in the gills. A lot of them have different colors when you put potassium hydroxide on them than when they don't have KOH. Um, and then quaternary subgenus leprosibi are extremely bright in ultraviolet light. In fact, subgenus leprosibi are the brightest, the most fluorescent mushrooms out of any of them that I've seen. You can see them from a very long distance um, and they glow this bright gold color, beautiful. Do you know the name of the paper? Um, I might be able to pull it up if I Google it. It's like the Cortinarius flavo basilis played. I'll look it up. Alan, yeah. um, if you could send it to me, I will uh, put it on the description. We <laughs> add a lot of the uh, references or comments, uh, you know, uh, to the end of the description. So any member that goes on to our members only website, they can see all the descriptions with links right at the bottom. All right. We try to oh, incorporate okay, cool. that. And I did and, find the, the paper. So um, I'll, I'll paste that uh, into the chat right now. Martin, good to see you here. Welcome. And um, Alan, I think we should call it a night now. You've mm -hmm. been terrific with us. You've spent a lot of time. It's a fascinating um, subject, outstanding photos, and an outstanding speaker. Thank you so very much. I'll get in touch with you tomorrow. Awesome. All the Thank best. you so much. All right. Okay. Thanks, Alan. Have a great Bye -bye. night. You too. All the best to you all.